All right, to recap. So week one, we looked at sort of, okay, here's the context of this period, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, the political revolution, the cultural revolution of the late 18th century. So then we did the American Revolution, which I said, I finally convinced, yes, it is a true revolution in the fundamental sense of the term as a political revolution, in some sense intellectual and cultural. Then uh, last week we looked at Haiti, which is clearly a revolution, but in a fundamentally different sense. This is a social revolution. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the background of Spanish America. As I mentioned at the very beginning, there's no way to cover all the wars for independence in the Americas. There's too many of them. Um, so what I'm going to do is sort of talk in general about Spanish America. The next time I'll talk about, in episode five, <laughs> talk about the great figures. I'll focus mainly on northern and southern South Amer Spanish America, which means you get to bring in Simon Bolivar, namesake of Bolivar, Tennessee, and seven other cities in the United States. <laughs> I actually helped put that bust in the plaza. I had my own small part. I helped unload it from a car into another car so they could go to Bolivar, Tennessee. Uh, this was a long time ago. Um, and we'll look at S San Martin and, and Simon Bolivar and my favorite name in Latin American history, Bernardo O'Higgins, <laughs> the liberator of Chile. Okay, but that's next. And then, then, the fi then week six, which apparently we're meeting at the Siegenthaler Center, I guess, week six. Um, we'll look at my two favorite countries, Brazil and Texas. <laughs> it actually works when you, see, when you see this. Okay, so here we go. So Spanish America, whoops. There we go. So when you, this is sort of coming back to week one, but specifically looking at Spanish America. When you look at Spanish America, one of the striking things actually is how long this empire lasts. Here is this place which for three, in some cases for 300 years, this is under Spanish control. That's a long, long time. Because I mean, if you look at the United States, right? Especially if you're doing the sort of Jamestown, 1607, 1609, Independence, 17, the war begins in 17, that's only a century and a half. It only takes us about a century and a half to go, oh, no, no, maybe we're going to go our own way. In Spanish America, this lasts for 300 years, and if we were to look around Spanish America in about 1800, you wouldn't probably have predicted that wars were about to break out all across Spanish America. So it's actually striking how stable and enduring this is, but it also means that by the time you get to 1800, you have very highly developed colonial elites. So again, think of the American experience. Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, where by the 1770s you've got these families that have been there for a while. They, they identify with the region. They see themselves as distinct from the British. Well, imagine if you're in Mexico or Peru, where you may have families that date back to the mid-16th century by in, in 1800. So these are people who have longer rooted traditions and identification with the locale. They may still see themselves as Spaniards, which reason means we're not like all these Indians. And certainly not all this riffraff mixed race people. Right? But they also do not see themselves as Spaniards in the same sense as somebody who's just arrived from Madrid or Seville. So the fact that you have colonies that have been there for a long, long time, highly developed bureaucracies, taxation systems, local officials, that's really important in looking to Spanish America. This is much more so than when we get to Brazil. This is not really an issue in Brazil. Uh, and there is a distinction by the 18th century in the terminology when you're referring to Spaniards to distinguish between those who are from the Americas and those who were born in Spain on the peninsula. So Spaniards in the Americas who were born in Spain are known as peninsulares, right? They're from the peninsula. And they let the locals know this, because right? it's sort of, OK, you're not really as good as us. Okay? And those who are locally born become known as Creoles. Right? The original use of the term Creole in the Americas was to refer to the child of an African born in the Americas. Okay? But in Spanish America, it becomes the term of the 18th century of Spaniards, but who were born in the Americas, people of Spanish descent. So there's a very clear sense emerging in the 18th century of a distinction at that highest level. Again, it's this pyramid. I'll say this again. It's my, 
I always say this to repeat. In Latin, um, Latin America, until the 20th century, and in some cases to the middle of the 20th century, the vast majority of people are of non-European origin. And in the places like Mexico, Guatemala, Peru, Ecuador, that means they're Indians. Right? In places like the Caribbean and Brazil, they're Africans or people of African descent. So by the 18th century, you start to see this distinction emerge. This is at the heart of the struggle. And again, this is like the American Revolution. Right? In this sense, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, they're Creoles. Right? They're Brits, but born in the Americas. Um, now, what's crucial for you guys like kings and queens, here it is. Here's your moment. <laughs> um, the Habsburgs, which originally from Austria, right, become the ruling family at the beginning of the 16th century in Spain. Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, who's actually Charles I of Spain, one of the great figures in European history in the 16th century, is actually born in Ghent, right, but his Grandparents are Spanish. When he arrives at the age of 16 to Spain for the first time to assume the throne, he does not speak Spanish. Right? His son, Philip II, who is an equally great figure in a very different way, is the second of these Habsburg rulers. So you have the Spanish Habsburgs, and then there's this whole other branch in Austria. So for a couple of hundred years, it's the Habsburgs that rule Spain. Right, and they're really lucky in the 16th century. It's rare to get a combination in royal families where you get somebody as amazing as a father and son duo like this. Charles V, the great warrior of the Counter-Reformation of the 16th century, who rarely spends time in Spain. And his son, Philip II, who is the great bureaucrat. Anybody ever been to the Escorial outside Madrid? He builds this incredible palace, and he's got this tiny little modest bedroom, right, which has a little window that opens up and looks down over the over the altar, right? Uh, I remember being in the Escorial one time and nearly being trampled by a group of nuns. Oh, Philip II is there. But it's, he's, he's the austere, right? His father is the warrior. He's the austere, bureaucratic. Every piece of the legend is like every piece of paper in the empire had to pass before his eyes. Right? But there are these great figures. Spain's great period is the 16th century. As we saw before in the 17th century, then you get the English and the French and the Dutch challenged there. Well, short version of this here is in 1700, the Habsburg king dies. Uh, the lovely uh, <coughs> bewitched. Right? Um, Charles, who dies, apparently is impotent. The Habsburgs, this is the royal families, these guys all marry on purpose in the family, right? It's like cousins and aunts and uncles. It is, so he's not only odd looking, but he apparently was not real with it. So he's king for the last third of the 17th century, right? He dies childless. This causes a succession crisis. So what do you do when you have a succession crisis? You fight over who's going to be the new king. So when he dies in 1700, it sets off a war that lasts from 1700 to 1713. But again, my emphasis in this course, this is a global struggle among European powers. So the British, the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese, Everybody's interested in who's going to be king of Spain because it affects the balance of power in Europe and in these empires. So the short version of this is that the French succeed in placing a member of the French royal family, the Bourbons, on the throne of Spain. Right. They managed to do this, but at a great cost. Right. The resolution of this war, which affects continents, right, especially the Americas, is the French have to make certain concessions. Right. Some of these are territorial, some of them are financial, and they have to agree that the Bourbon monarchy in Spain will remain separate from the monarchy in France. But let's face it, for the first couple of generations at least in Spain, these guys are speaking French at the court, <laughs> Castilian is secondary. But what, well, so the Bourbons come to power in Spain in 1700 and they last until now, right? Had a few problems along the way. Juan Carlos, the king of Spain, is, is the descendant of this line. So what will happen is France, here's a short version. Here you go, Linda. In the 17th century, the French revamp, reorganize, rationalize. So what do you do when the French come on the throne in Spain in the 18th century? They revamp the empire. So the great fact of the 18th century in the Spanish empire, and the Portuguese as well, 
is they try and revamp the entire empire. And part of this is go, why are we losing all the time? <laughs> why are we losing ground to the English and the Dutch? And oh my God, how do we do something about this? So part of what's happening under the Bourbons are what become called in Spanish American history the Bourbon reforms of the 18th century. But I also want to emphasize that this is a period in which these reforms are taking place that the radicals we've already seen, right? These are monarchs reforming their empire. The radicals of the age of revolution out there going, ah, what do we need kings for? What do we need priests? Question authority. And you've got this trading and economic revolution taking place at the same time. So here's the short version. So when the war of Spanish succession is settled, the Bourbons then focus on the empire. The height of this is about the middle of the 18th century under Charles III. I always say it's rationalized, centralized, and nationalized. It's the Isis. Even though nationalized doesn't really, you're talking about an empire. It's not really a nation. So what will happen is they say, okay, we got to look at this empire and revamp it. After a couple of hundred years, the administrative units don't fit anymore. We have to look to make sure whether all the organizational structure looks the way it should to make sure that it makes sense. In a place like Spanish America, these colonies have grown dramatically for a couple of hundred years and the administrative units no longer fit as well. So they will completely reorganize the entire global empire. But the central principle in this is to centralize power. Right? This is where you really see the Anglo-American trajectory go in a different direction from the Ibero-American. At the very moment that the king is becoming weak, the monarchy becomes gradually weaker in England, and you get these American revolutionaries going, that's not far enough. In the Spanish and Portuguese empires, the monarchies are becoming stronger, more powerful, and closing off space. It's a completely different direction. This is a, the enlightened despots of the 18th century means, I will even be more powerful. I may be kind, beneficent, and wise, but I will have all power. So the focus of the Bourbon reforms is really to centralize power in the hands of the monarchy. So as they revamp the empire and change the administrative structures, they weaken local power, they weaken regional power, all power will flow back to the center. So it's a reassertion in Spanish America of imperial authority. Now why this matters in Spanish America for the wars for independence is for the previous hundred years, these guys have been pretty much left alone. It's kind of like the American Revolution, America, British colonies before about 1750. Because the Spanish crown's in such chaos, the English are so powerful, local officials have been pretty much left alone to do their thing. They're, they're checked up on all the time, but local officials. So what you see is that more and more Creoles assume positions of authority and power. There's a couple of guys in the 1970s that actually did a quantitative study that they went back and track every bureaucrat in the Spanish-American empire, and they did a collective biography. This must have been boring to do. <laughs> and they, but they tabulated, it all actually fits in one bar chart, when the, the bottom line, it shows you number of Creoles in position of authority in the Spanish empire. And the bar chart goes up and up and up. You get to about 1720, and it goes down, 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 down. So what does that mean? It means after being used to running things locally, for about 100 years, Madrid comes back and goes, we'll take it from here, right? And we don't trust locals. We're going to put guys directly from Spain in positions of authority. So it's not only saying this is what's going to happen, we are going to systematically discriminate against you guys because we don't trust you. You've gone native. So the central friction in Spanish America is the reassertion of imperial authority under these Bourbon reforms, which systematically excludes Creoles from positions of power. And this had always been true at the very highest level. The viceroys that go out, they're always Spaniards. All right, but now what happens, all these guys who are running local courts, administration, military officials, all of these guys are being told, you cannot hold those positions of authority because you're not one of us. So this is really the heart of the matter. The reassertion, this is kind of like the U.S. in that after 1763, to pay for all those wars, you get more military presence, more taxation. Because ultimately what rationalized administration means is let's make sure everybody pays their taxes and pays them more efficiently. So suddenly, these tax collectors start showing up going, you know, you got to pay now. 
because we have to finance the empire. So taxation out of this revamp of the empire and the systematic discrimination against Creoles is really at the heart of the matter. So this is like the 13 colonies, right? Reassertion of imperial authority and tax, tax, tax. And this affects really, this is not affecting the poor guys, it affects the really powerful guys who are way behind in their taxes, plantation owners and powerful merchants. The usual take on the Bourbon reforms is this is the last gasp of the Spanish Empire to try and salvage its power in the face of Britain and to a lesser extent France. And it's too little and too late. All right, so that's the big picture. By the time you get to about 1800, all these Creoles have gone, hmm, American Revolution, interesting, but a little dangerous and radical. They're going, Haitian Revolution, good reason why we shouldn't start wars, right? So in 1800, they're not looking around going, oh, let's rise up and copy the Americans. Almost no one, we're going to see here, there's an except, prominent except, almost no one is willing to stand up and say, yeah, let's do like those guys in Massachusetts. So what starts the wars for Spanish-American independence, ironically, is the French Revolution of Napoleon, strangely enough. Um, once again, French Revolution breaks out in 1789. General Tegon, you get about a decade of chaos, violence, and upheaval. After 1799, in retrospect, Napoleon will emerge. So from 1799 until 1815, Napoleon dominates European history. He also dominates history of a lot of other places as well. Here it is, short verse. So Napoleon, eventually, French armies sweep across Europe. They conquer, topple monarchies, replace them with his friends and relatives. So by the time you get to 1807, Napoleon has, is controlling or dominating the entire European continent from the Pyrenees to Eastern Europe. The only two places he doesn't control are the Russian Empire to the east and Spain and Portugal in the south. The English are going, hmm, looks bad. <laughs> so the English control the oceans. Napoleon cannot invade England. Right? So what does Napoleon do? He wants to hit the English where it hurts the most, which is in the pocketbook. So he will close off the continent to European trade and goods. Right? England emerges the great industrial manufacturer, textiles, and close the market. Right? England controls the seas. Napoleon closes off the continent. But the problem is the Portuguese are long-standing allies with the British, and goods keep coming through St. Petersburg. So Napoleon, figuring he's very clever, goes east in 1807, meets with the Tsar Alexander I, the young Tsar Alexander I, knowing that he's buying time. And he says, OK, let's bury the hatchet here. I'm not interested in you guys. You keep the English out. We'll leave you alone. And he's thinking, and then I'll be back. <laughs> so he sort of makes his temporary peace with the Russians, knowing that he's going to later invade to his, as every, everyone who invades Russia finds out it's a bad idea. Right? Um, so then he turns to Spain and Portugal. So he actually invades Portugal first. He says to the Portuguese monarchy, the Braganzas, you know, you got to close off. Keep the English out, break these ties. The English have been deeply engaged with the Portuguese since the 14th century. Intermarrying, right? Who is the wife of Henry VIII, who he gives up for Anne Boleyn? It's Catherine of Aragon, right? So there's this long connection between the British, the Portuguese, and the Spanish, right? Going back and forth, right? And so the Portuguese basically go, we can't do that. So Napoleon then asks the king of Spain if he can pass across northwestern Spain to invade Portugal. And this is where you see the Portuguese are smarter than the Spanish. <laughs> the Portuguese, hmm, let's see, what's the options here? We can either stay, Napoleon will come, we'll either be deposed and put in prison, or we'll rule as puppets, and we lose our global empire. We get to keep Portugal, but we lose the empire. Or we could flee. And they've actually been expecting this. One of my first moments as a historian was as an undergraduate working in a research library. And I had enough Portuguese. They wanted me to read through these documents someone had bought and had never been cataloged. And part of the documents was correspondence in the Portuguese court 
discussing in the 1790s what to do if the, Brit if the French invaded. So already in the mid-1790s they're thinking, okay, what do we do? We should leave. So on British warships, 15,000 people in November of 1807 board ships and within only 24 hours before French troops arrive, they sail out of the harbor and head for Brazil. Okay. So the Portuguese, rather than be imprisoned, made into puppets, the Braganza royal family will load up the royal library, the treasury. I'll talk more about this when we get to Brazil. The crazy queen, who's literally out of her mind at this point. Uh, they will, the king, the, the prince, consort's wife, who is Spanish, right? The entire family, everybody heads off for Brazil. So when the French come into Portugal in November of 1807, they occupy, take control, but the monarchy is left, which means that the, Port what the French control is only Portugal. The, Brazil the Portuguese will run the Portuguese empire for the next 13 years from Rio de Janeiro with British protection. Okay, so the Portuguese are smarter. Um, what will happen is the Spanish are, I don't know, these, this, what a sordid cast of characters here. <laughs> um, the Spanish Bourbons at this point are not exactly at their peak. Um, Carlos IV, Charles IV, who rules from 1788 to 1808, is not exactly your exemplary monarch. Uh, the family is, what a crew. Um, this famous painting is painted by Francisco Goya. You're going to see a couple, few more Goya paintings here. It's like one of the great, I love Goya, one of the great painters of all time. And you look at this thing, you can't believe he painted this other stuff I'm about to show you. you know, what, a, what a guy. Um, this is the royal family. Uh, what a misbehaved lot. Ferdinand, who is standing in the back there, the tall guy, is the, will become the king. This is his lovely, uh, Carlos's lovely wife over here, who's a piece of work, uh, who is having an affair with the guy standing behind Carlos, who's Manuel de Godoy, the sort of prime minister, I guess you'd say. And Fernando, who the, the king to be, Fernando, is, will be Fernando VII. This is his wife, young child. Um, this is a family that's just rife with all sorts of problems. They're not exactly the brightest people around. Short version of this is Napoleon shows up and Napoleon says, all right, I think we need to talk. Why don't you come to southern France and we'll chat at my chateau. All of them show up, right? <laughs> and he goes, well, you know, I tell you what, I'm taking control here. Why don't you be my guest permanently? <laughs> like, what are they thinking? So he basically imprisons the Spanish monarchy and he will place his half-brother Joseph I don't know, Jose never strikes me as a noble name for a king, but he puts his brother Joseph on the throne of Spain. Um, he's referred to by the Spanish as Jose Botellas, Joe Bottles. <laughs> I love that. Um, so Napoleon's invasion of Spain then, with lots of North African mercenary troops, right, is the spark that creates a crisis which sets off, of all things, the, the revolutions in Spanish America. <coughs> um, this is old Joseph down here. When the, this is the famous painting, The Surrender of Madrid. But Francisco Goya, one of the great painters in Western art, is the official court painter, and then he lives through all this. Um, I'll show you a couple of paintings here in a second. What it provokes is a massive uprising all over Spain against the French troops which are often not French. This is where we get the word guerrilla, a little war, guerrilla, right? because these are not always official troops in uniform. They're attacking, ambushing, fleeing. Uh, the uprisings in May of 1808, especially in Madrid, are captured by Goya in some of the most famous paintings of all time. So what you get is a war across the Iberian Peninsula in both Portugal and Spain from 1807 to 1813 or 14, in which the French are trying to maintain control of the peninsula. The English, led by Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, invades Portugal, right, 
So there's a war taking place all across Spain and Portugal. The monarchy, for all intents and purposes, has been deposed. There is a French monarch on the throne. And so many of those loyal to the monarchy across Spain will form what are called juntas, right? These sort of ruling councils to rule in the name of the deposed king who is now disgraced, so their hero becomes the, the future Fernando VII. So all of these people who are absent a monarch remain loyal to the monarchy. They form these councils all over Spain to remain loyal and to rule in the name of the imprisoned king. Right? So the reaction is not to rise up and overthrow the monarchy. It's to support it. Um, so strangely enough, it doesn't overthrow the monarchy. The uprisings in May 1808, which are captured in the upper left and the bottom right, are some of the most famous paintings in Western art. Um, Goya also has this incredible series of sketches and paintings on the horrors of war, which are just, I mean, I, I had to choose carefully which ones to show. I mean, some of them are incredibly shocking. But these are sort of documenting, right, the atrocities of war on the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, so when you see Goya, you go, wow, look at this guy. <laughs> he, he could be this sort of very official staid cord painter, and then he could paint this kind of stuff, which is so stunning. Um, so the, these uprisings in May of 1808, which fail, right, which were part of this war, actually provoke some of the great art in the West. All right, so for Spanish America, this proposes a dilemma for all of those elites. What do you do? Because what's happened here now is you've been handed autonomy. Right? Because the English control the oceans, the French can't cross, which means there is no direct connection between the Spanish throne and Spanish America. So what do you do? The striking thing here is virtually all of the elites remain loyal to the monarchy. So you see the same sort of thing in almost all of Spanish America where local elites both peninsulars and Creoles say, our hero is Fernando VII, the imprisoned king, the nasty French. We will rule in his absence. Right? They do not declare independence. The rebels, the small minority of whom you'll see here in a second, do say, aha, this is it. Here's our chance. Right? Let's forge ahead, corrupt monarchy, church. Let's seize the opportunity and use this moment of weakness to declare independence. They are clearly in the minority. So what you get is a set of wars that break out in Spanish America beginning in 1808, where I don't know, 10,000 people of European descent, maybe, and Venezuela. Right? Those are the two spots where rebellion breaks out first. I'm not going to go into Argentina, but Argentina is actually a very odd case because British troops coming from South Africa in 1806 and 1807 actually twice invade Buenos Aires and are repelled by locals many of whom then become rebels against the empire because the viceroy is so inept in protecting their 
interest. So in what today is the Rio de la Plata, especially Buenos Aires, that region, that actually experiences some of the earliest moments of rebellion, but it's a reaction to foreign invasion. Paraguay is like the most unusual case in Latin American history, I'd say. Paraguay is up the river, completely isolated. Right? Paraguay is, the southern part of Paraguay is where the, where the Jesuits for centuries have had the mission. How many of you guys seen the mission? Robert De Niro is a Jesuit. Look, Robert De Niro, you talking to me, God? <laughs> Robert De Niro, every time I see that, I think. That movie, right, is based on this moment in the late 18th century when Spain and Portugal divide their empires. That huge section of what today is southern Paraguay, a little bit of northeastern Argentina and southern Brazil are part of this Jesuit mission system. This place is incredibly isolated. The Spanish who come in there and settle are few in number. They intermarry with the local indigenous population who speak Guarani. It is a bicultural, bilingual society. Right? It is completely isolated from the rest of the empire. So when independence comes and the Argentines try and hold on to Paraguay, there is one brief battle where a few hundred loyalist troops march north to what today is Paraguay. They're defeated, it's over, that's it. So Paraguayan independence happens with one battle. And for all intents and purposes after that, the Paraguayans go off their own way. Right? And for until the 1870s, Paraguay turns completely internal and closes itself off to the outside world, completely. So it's really not until the 1870s when the Brazilians, right, in the 1860s invade and basically occupy Paraguay that it opens up to the outside world. So Paraguay is a very unusual case. So in these early revolts, what happens is you get, you know, uprisings, rebellions, but in every case except for these two, they're put down. So Argentina, for all intents and purposes, by about 1810, is independent. Paraguay is independent. But in all the other cases, Mexico, northern South America, the Andes, all of the early revolts are crushed. But it takes about five or six years to do this. Right? So you fight wars for five or six years and create bloodshed and dissent. The general, the, when you look at that map, what you got? The general rule in Spanish America is countries tend to emerge out of, in most cases, what were audiencias, which was sort of a regional jurisdiction. In Spanish America, there, when the Bourbons reorganize in the 18th century, when they start the reorganization, there are two vice royalties, right? There's New Spain, which is basically the Caribbean, Mexico, Central America, and there's Peru, which is basically their South American colonies. They look at this in the 18th century and say this makes no sense. So they create a vice royal, they carve out two more vice royalties, the northern tier of South America, which is basically what today is Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and then they carve off southern South America, basically Paraguay, Chile, Argentina, is a separate one. So those four units are the big pieces of the empire. None of those remain intact. Those split and largely uh, along more or less where those in provincial jurisdictions were. All the, all the, the powerful settlers have land grants, but the, what's important is where did you have your administrative unit? So it's sort of, there are these things called audiencias, which are essentially administrative and judicial districts. There are a lot of them in Mexico. So Mexico is an exception. This is most of Mexico, what Mexico loses theoretically is Central America, because Central America is a dependency of Mexico. Uh, so Central America will, it is so isolated from Mexico, and Mexico is in such chaos in the 1820s that the Central Americans go, we're breaking from Mexico. The Mexicans send down some troops that go, what are we doing here? And they go home. So the issue in Central America then becomes, this was a captaincy general that had five pieces, which were separate administrative units. Those are now five countries. In northern South America, in the vice royalty of New Granada, the separate jurisdictions were essentially what today is Venezuela, 
Colombia, and Ecuador. If you look at what was the vice royalty of Peru, there was one unit which was called Peru and Upper Peru because it's higher, which is Bolivia. So Bolivia breaks off. Right? What was the administrative unit of the Captaincy General of Chile becomes a country. And in the vice royalty of La Plata, Paraguay was a separate administrative district. It breaks away. So they sort of fracture along these administrative units. This is why when we look at Brazil. What's striking about Brazil is always common. Brazil does not fragment. But I would argue that's largely because it's newer and the regional elites are less developed. So the base rule is where you have really well-developed regional elites with those kind of administrative positions and authority, they hang on to that regional unit. There are a few exceptions. So pieces of what today is northern Chile had belonged to Peru. The Chileans and, Peru and, the Chileans and Argentines will argue over who owns what today is Patagonia, right, where the where that, they actually argue this until very recently. <laughs> um, in Paraguay and Bolivia, those borders will change in the 19th and 20th century over war. Uh, but they pretty much fragment along these administrative lines. Uh, so where you get well-developed regional elites, this fragments. The parallel in the United States would be, it was conceivable, it almost happened, right, that these sort of southern tier of states colonies, then states saw themselves as sort of a different unit. They saw themselves as a collective, different from the northern tier. We almost fragmented that way. So as you get these regional developments over 300 years, uh, in some cases they fail because there are efforts to separate off from pieces of Colombia or Peru that fail. Uh, Mexico, there's chunks of that where there's efforts to separate off, they fail. So what you're going to get, it, but what this will do is it'll create enormous divisions, right? You fight any kind of rebellions and upheaval. You create bloodshed, animosity, factionalism. So part of the cause of the second set of wars is all of the divisions that emerge out of that first set of wars, even the ones that fail. But again, out of that first set, by 1814, you really only have two nations who have emerged out of this independence. A whole other set of wars emerge after 1814, and that's because Napoleon loses, right? Spain, once again, is under, Habsburg, is, uh, is under the rule of the Bourbons. Fernando VII comes back to the throne. And while he was gone, all of these juntas, the most radical, drew up a constitution. And they go, welcome back, but now you'll be a constitutional monarch. And he goes, we're going back to the 18th century. <laughs> Forget this concept. So he basically says, ignore all this. So all the, those years of autonomy, local rule, both in Spain and Spanish America, any effort to create a constitutional monarchy and restrict it, he goes, no. So this is what's usually called the return of absolutism. Right? So at this point, he comes back and says, no, no, no. We're running this thing the way I was in the 18th century. I'm in control here. So this, there are a lot of Creoles and some peninsulars in, the, in Spanish America who had hoped when Fernando VII came back, he was going to be the great figure who reunited them, but under a constitutional monarchy. When it's clear he's going to rule completely with an iron hand, they go, this is it. So it's actually the return of Fernando VII and those wounds created by the first set of wars that sparked a second series of wars, almost all of which are successful. Um, so this is really... A, there's really a whole new wave that lasts. 1826, you'll get different dates on this. It depends on what you consider sort of the last major struggle, right? There's a major battle in what today is Peru, right, that is usually considered sort of the final major epi even though there are other battles that take place after this. So when people like dates and, you know, when we create course titles like the Wars for Independence or Spain. 1825, sometimes you see 1826. It depends on which one of these battles you think really was the last big battle. There's nothing like Yorktown, like, okay, we're done. <laughs> right? um, so it's mid-1820s. So here we go. This is our lead into all the biographical stuff. Next week, it'll all be rebels <laughs> who succeed, usually. Um, in Latin American history, you have, like, the liberator. That's Simon Bolivar, right? Founder of, I don't know, six, seven new nations. Right? And Miranda here is the precursor, big capital letter, right? 
Uh, this guy is one of the most interesting figures in the history of the Western world in the 18th and 19th century. This guy, he is everywhere. And this guy leads the most interesting, amazing life you can imagine. But he's a good example, he, and he's also unusual, and he's ahead of everybody else, which is why you'll see next week how he ends up. Um, he's born in what today is Venezuela in Caracas. Caracas is this vibrant port export center for cacao. This is where Venezuela made its money before it discovered oil. They're exporting chocolate back to Europe, so that it's the merchants, lots of them who are originally from the Basque country in Spain. It's all of these chocolate merchants. I always love this. It's, the essence of this is chocolate. <laughs> really, really wealthy merchants who's interested in markets, and they really are feeling restrained by this Spanish imperial system, which doesn't allow them access to British markets and British merchants. So the big contraband regions in Spanish America are the coast of northern South America and Argentina. These are, the, these are the weak points entering the empire. So Miranda's father is Spanish, and his mother is from the Venezuelan elite. Right? But as a young man, he leaves and he goes off to Spain and joins the army. This guy goes everywhere. And he's fighting in North Africa. He actually he fights at Pensacola in the American Revolution. This guy is all over the place. Um, so he starts as a, in a military career, and so he really is deeply engaged in the wars, all in all, every sense in the age of revolution. Um, he actually travels to the United States in the 1780s, and he has dinner with everybody. I mean, you name it, who's important, he meets them. Right. Um, so he has this incredible life. Right. Even by 1784, wow, what a life this guy's lived. But then. Not to get bored, he then travels across Europe. Reputed support, there's never any clear evidence on this. So sort it of depends on you. Supported, reportedly one of the lovers of Catherine the Great of Russia. Right. He spends time in Moscow and St. Petersburg. He is everywhere. And in the 1790s, he gets involved in the French Revolution. He becomes a general in the French Revolution and on two occasions is within hours of being under the guillotine. This guy is all over the place. Um, he manages to escape eventually from France and go to England, and he settles in London, and his house becomes the great meeting grounds of all those Spanish Americans who think, well, maybe this is it. Maybe it's time. Right? And this is in you know, 1804, 1805, before Napoleon, or before any of this has taken place which is why Miranda is seen as the precursor. He's like the father figure of the great revolutionaries who will engage in the wars that succeed. Um, so while he's in London, he and all of his associates are constantly working on the British, help us, help us, help us, think how good this is going to be for you if the Spanish right, get kicked out of Spanish America. Think of the markets. Right? Think of access, right? resources. And they're never very successful, but he does have this brief moment in 1806 when they have an ill-fated expedition to the coast of Venezuela. Uh, and he's, or the US is involved in this unofficially. Right? He comes to New York and at one point persuades all these guys to join him. Apparently he doesn't exactly tell these guys he recruits what they're doing. And they show up on the coast of Venezuela and he goes, you know, let me tell you <laughs> what we're about to do. Um, so he has an expedition that fails, but he manages to escape and he goes back to London. So Miranda is this figure who has an enormous resume, right? Imagine meeting this guy if you're somebody who's interested in changing the world. <laughs> the people he's known and met and the places he's been, what he's been engaged in, he knows everybody. Um, so back in London, his house is really this gathering point. And this is the sort of segue to next week. And out of this, the most important of these people who comes to his house is a young Venezuelan, right, from Caracas, by the name of Simon Bolivar, who becomes his protege and Miranda is like, here's the father figure. The son, as we'll see next week, this is, is, has a very interesting resolution on this. But So what you see then is Miranda is really at the cutting edge of this. He's not going to live to see the results of his work. Right? But he is really at the heart of that initial unrest and upheaval. What it also shows you is that when he's trying to do this in 1805, 1806, 1807, hard to get anybody interested. It's hard to make this happen. It really takes those Napoleonic invasions, 
the severing of the connection between Madrid and Spanish America, to all those Spanish Americans start going, okay, what do we do next? And at that point, that some of them start listening to somebody like Moran and going, maybe he's right. Maybe this is the moment. But you get to see Bolivar, Bolivar next week. Questions? A lot of names and dates. The Portuguese, there's, there's a war going on. Basically, it's English troops invade Portugal. And so from 1808 to about 1812, the, the British are basically retaking Portugal. Um, we'll see this in week six when I get to Brazil. Even though by 1813, 1814, Portugal is back under, is out of the control of Napoleon, the Portuguese king stays in Rio for 13 more years. So the Portuguese monarchy will not return to Lisbon until 1821. John, or João, the Portuguese king, likes Rio. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> and he goes, no, I'm staying here. So the, it's the odd case, right? You have this port, it's the only example in the history of the Western world where the European monarch rules from the colonies. It's the only example of this. Yeah, the question is about the contrast of Argentina. Paraguay literally closes off. There's some famous European travelers who will wander into Paraguay studying botany or something, and they never let them leave. And it's this kind of place where it's like, come on in. Hotel California, you can check in, but you can never check out, right? Paraguay is completely, Paraguay, it's whole, or Argentina. Argentina is an odd sort of, it's kind of like Canada in a sense, I mean, in a lot of ways. Right? I mean. Argentina has this huge plains, right, flip-flop in North America. It basically, in the late 19th century, plants wheat, cattle, right, and wine. Right. Um, so it will become this agro-exporting economy. But in the early 19th century, Buenos Aires is the port, and there are all these sort of provinces. So the great struggle in Argentina from about 1810 to the 1850s is to actually bring it all under single jurisdiction. The great battle in Argentina is between what we would think of as the centralists and the federalists, right? Those who want to be left alone to have sort of what you call states' rights and have a loose confederation, and those who want a centralized power. It's not until the 1850s that Buenos Aires actually exerts control and authority over the rest. And it basically that means northern, what today is northern Argentina. Patagonia is like the U.S. West. Indigenous peoples, very few outsiders, no effective occupation. Argentina will occupy and take control of Patagonia in the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, just as we do in the West. You send in the army, eventually track down, you either annihilate or put people on reservations and extend control over it. So it's really that sort of northern half of Argentina that is a bunch of provinces which are loosely connected. And it's really not to the 1850s. And it's really after the 1850s they then turn out it really become this big exporting power. Argentina, by the First World War, is one of the ten richest countries in the world per capita. Exports: beef, beef and wheat, and today we all know it for wine, right? Um, so, Argentina is it's a port, it's basically a port city at that point, and Paraguay is closed off to the rest of the world. You're surprisingly quiet. <laughs> How do you like those tights? <laughs> there are, I think, eight cities in the United States named after Simone Bolivar. Uh, I know Bolivar, right, on the way to, on the way to Memphis. Uh, there's a Point Bolivar near Galveston that I grew up knowing. I'm not sure where the others are. I think maybe there's one in Missouri. This is the great d dilemma. If you're in Mexico, or if you're in Peru, or Bolivia, and war breaks out, what's going to happen with that 75, 80% of the population that's indigenous? Uh, and this is the story of Mexico. 
1810, if you, Mexico just celebrated its bicentennial, right? Um, Mexico always seems to have incredible problems around 10, right? 1910, the Mexican Revolution, they're having a few problems now. 1810, it's a, it's a Catholic priest, Father Hidalgo, who rises up literally in church and says, this is it. He is an incredible, radical figure, even for that period. Um, he amasses around him in what's today Guanajuato, Querétaro, and the, it's the northern fringe, right? It's not in Mexico City. Eventually, 80,000 people, largely indigenous and mixed race, and they manage to surround Mexico City. This is the greatest fear of the Spanish-American elites, that their war will un unleash what is literally a race war. Hidalgo hesitates at this moment. His troops begin to go home, and eventually Hidalgo will be tracked down and executed. There's a famous moment in Guanajuato, which is this old mining center, right, silver mining. There's this enormous, you can see this today, there's this enormous, what was a granary. It looks like a fortress in the center of the city. It's a square. When Hidalgo's hordes literally come down and surround this, there's a siege. When they manage to break in, they slaughter everyone. And this is a pretty clear message to the elites in Mexico City. This is what is likely to happen to you if you lose. When Hidalgo and his conspirators are captured and executed, he's decapitated and his head is placed on one of the corners of the granary in Guanajuato. This is what happens for traitors. Um, so what it sets off in Mexico initially the, the first war is a race war. It's a social uprising. So both Creoles and Peninsulars close ranks and say, we must stop this. And so that initial moment of Mex what today Mexico celebrates is that great moment, right? The, the shout of Hidalgo, 1810, unleashes a social revolution which the Spanish Creoles and Spanish Peninsulars close ranks and suppress. A very bloody suppression. And so. Mexico, its independence is really in two phases. There's the initial uprising, which is a social rebellion, which is crushed. And in 1821 and 22, it's actually the elites who at that moment, now that they've solved all their differences, basically say, okay, this is it. Let's, let's make the move. Yeah, well, I'd say what happens. Yeah, you know, I'd say what happens in the 17th century. You get French coming into lots of the islands as they take control of them. Saint Domingue being the big base. But what will happen is you got circulation of these guys all over the Caribbean. And once the Haitian Revolution takes place, many of them disperse all over the Caribbean. So they go to, into the southern U.S. So you're going to get these sort of French expatriates from the island of, of San Domingo who go all over the Caribbean basin. Caribbean's pretty interesting because it's where the revolutions don't happen. Cuba and Puerto Rico become the bastions of troops as the tens of thousands of Spanish troops eventually after 1814 come across the Atlantic where they land first, where they s depart from to go er elsewhere is San Juan and Havana. So they become the great fortresses of the empire and you do not have wars for independence in those places. And they're, in frolic, they're occupied by Spanish troops, large numbers. Of, and in Cuba, what's happened in Haiti really dissuades the Cuban planters from any sort of uprising. Until 1898. So, so they, that becomes a sort of staging ground. That's where you send troops to Venezuela or Mexico or Central America or Colombia. Um, so this is what the usual take on Cuba and Puerto Rico is it's almost impossible to have an uprising in those two places because that's the, that's the garrisons. Uh, so it looks very, so they don't, so it's, the Cubans will have uprisings throughout the 19th century. So in the mid 19th century, the Ten Years War, which is a very bloody war that fails to achieve independence and actually opens the door for U.S. investment, right? All those Cuban planters who are destroyed by that war all their properties are bought up and controlled then by U.S. investors, sugar, railroads, steam engines. So the last third of the 19th century, Cuba becomes totally Americanized. 
So when the war comes in 1898, the U.S. already is the dominant investor, the dominant infrastructure, the dominant trading partner with Cuba, even though it's under Spanish control. And Puerto Rico is kind of, it's, all, it's almost an afterthought, and this is, this is getting way ahead of myself. When we invade Cuba in 1898, right, the Spanish-American War, uh, there's this famous moment where McKinley supposedly kneels down, he goes before Congress to ask for, ask for a declaration of war after the Maine is blown up, which we're still not sure who actually did this, right? Even after sophisticated studies in recent years. Um, he says, gentlemen, I got down on my knees in the Oval Office and I prayed to the Almighty for guidance, something, and he said, invade the Philippines? <laughs> invade Guam? It's Puerto Rico? So the incidents in Cuba are the spark for U.S. invasion, but that's when we, the Puerto Ricans are going, all right, this is it, independence, and suddenly U.S. warships show up, go, we'll take it from here. Uh, we move into Manila, we move in, into the Pacific, right? So that incident in Cuba basically becomes the first great moment of U.S. global expansion. Yeah, Paul, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've heard a lot about the African slave trade, but how much enslavement was there of the indigenous Indian population? Uh, question about Indian slavery. When the Spanish first show up in some places, usually where they're not very large, highly sedentary Indian populations, they try enslaving them. Uh, this happens in Brazil. In the mission, for example, in those opening scenes, Robert De Niro is a slave hunter. He's capturing Indians to enslave them. Uh, Brazil is sort of the classic example. They try and enslave Indians. The Indians either die off from European diseases, they flee, they fight back. It doesn't work. So they say, let's try this African slaver we've got in the islands of the Atlantic. So there's a pattern in the Caribbean in the 16th century in Brazil in the late 16th, early 17th, to try and enslave Indians. It just doesn't work. Uh, and they turn to African slave laborers because the Indians literally die off in droves. The Caribbean is completely depopulated by 1550. I mean, there are tens of thousands of Indians left out of millions. In Mexico, Guatemala, Ecuador, Bolivia, Peru, the heavy indigenous populations, Aztec Empire, Incan Empire, you have, even though it's the indigenous population drops by possibly 90% within two generations, this is the greatest demographic catastrophe in human history. Right. European diseases kill off probably as much as 90% of the population. The surviving population are still substantial, several million. They're highly organized. They're in an imperial system. So what they do in those cases is replace the empires that were there. In both empires, they had forced labor systems. It's not slavery. It's, it's essentially tribute labor. Uh, and the Spanish regularized this. So now instead of providing your tribute labor to the Aztecs, the Incas, you do it to the Spanish. So in those two core regions, it's, it's forced Indian labor that provides you with what you need. And this endures in some places into the 20th century, Bolivia being the prime example. Bolivia in 1950 essentially still has a system of forced servitude for, for Indian workers. Do you guys know this story? Oh, this is the American Holocaust. Um, because the two worlds are completely separate for thousands and thousands of years, the diseases that develop in the old world are unknown in the new world. It's like almost every di disease is developed in, in, in animal populations because we live literally in the same room with animals that then pass to humans and take on another form. So smallpox, influenza, measles, plague, bubonic. None, none of these are known in the Americas. So as soon as the Spanish start showing up, especially when the Africans show up with yellow fever, malaria, right, all these things are new. So even though Europeans die from smallpox and measles, right, they don't all die. Right? There's certain levels of immunity. So Asia, Africa, and Europe <coughs> have been interconnected for forever, right? Trade routes, people trading germs and genes and goods. So they've all been exposed. America's a completely unprotected. So in Cortez's conquest of Mexico, one of the guys on the expedition has smallpox. Somebody else eventually comes and has measles. When you read the Aztec accounts of the conquest, they're dying off in droves. There's codices, paintings of this, of people with sores all over their bodies. Uh, part of what makes it possible for Cortez to conquer Mexico is the Indians literally die off in droves. Now his Indian allies are dying too, but his men are not. So 
Between 1492 and 1550, the usual estimates are it's somewhere between 75 and 90 percent of the indigenous population disappears. So the great threat to the Americas is not just military invasion, Toledo steel, gunpowder, is disease. The only example possibly of it working the other way is syphilis. And there's still an ongoing debate about this. That in fact, possibly what happens is there was some kind of version of syphilis on both sides. But when they come together, they become more deadly. Um, so that you see syphilis, the first major outbreak of syphilis in Europe is the armies of Spain in the 1490s. Like, hmm, how did that happen? Um, so the demographic catastrophe. But what happens is the Indian population goes like this and then slowly grows to its, by the eight, end of the 18th century when the wars were in the century, it's still, a, it's still the majority of the population in those core regions. Silver. And so Silver. Pieces of eight. Well, this is why the si it's the silver from Mexico and Peru, actually Bolivia. It's called Peru. The silver from Mexico and Peru comes online in the 1550s, 1560s. So the great source of specie in the Western world from the late 16th century to about 1720 or so is American silver. I think somebody asked a question about this. It causes inflation in Europe, 1% a year, which is like staggering and completely distorts the economies. It's a different world, right? Uh, but there is actually a very famous book from the 1930s that tracks this, you know, the impact of silver. Then what happens is silver production, no one has a good explanation for this, drops after 1720. So for the next from after 1620. From 1620 to about 1720, there's this drop-off, which causes huge financial distortions in Europe, right, where you see the two worlds linked. There's no good explanation. The old explanation was the Indians all died off and there were no workers. It's clear now that it had nothing to do with labor. It's clear that the silver miners didn't have the vital elements they needed for some reason to produce silver, and that's mercury. You, you mix mercury with silver ore, and it extracts the impurities. You melt it, the, sil the impurities are, are melted off. There's mercury in Peru. There's mercury in Spain. It's not clear why. This is a great book for somebody, a graduate student. Some, why is it that they're not getting the mercury they needed to produce the silver? It's clearly, but after 1720, the silver rises again, and Mexico really becomes the gold. And then in Brazil, after 1700, it's gold. So it's American silver, right, and Brazilian gold that finances the 18th century industrial economic expansion. 80% of the gold circulating in Europe in the 18th century is coming out of Brazil. It's Brazil, it's largely, it goes, the mines of Brazil, Rio, Lisbon, London. It goes straight to London. Um, so I wouldn't call it stability, but that's the, that's the metal backing of what's going on. There's this whole new field of global history over the last 20 years has also shown incredible connections between the silver coming out of Asia, right? The connections between these bullion flows and economies that were Asian silver is crucial in this process too. It always comes down to the golden rule, right? <laughs> then that's got the gold rules. Difference for some people look at Napoleon and say, "Yeah, this is pretty interesting." But what overrides that is their sense of Spanishness. So that in the end, they're going, "This is an illegal, unprecedented, unacceptable invasion of Spanish authority." Because this is where it shows hierarchy really matters here, right? All of these people believe that there, there's somebody at the top that's the authority, right? And God's above that. And so the illegitimacy of the ruler is fundamental for those people who are monarchists. You have to have a legitimate monarch, and Napoleon doesn't count. And then for those who are anti-monarchists, they say, well, this just shows you that the system is completely flawed. All monarchs are illegitimate. We'll see when we get to Brazil. There's actually a very interesting marriage connection between 
the Portuguese royal family and Napoleon, that the, let's see if I remember this correctly, when the royal family from Portugal gets to Brazil, the crown prince is seven. When he comes of age in the 1820s, he marries the stepsister of Josephine. When she dies, he then marries the cousin. Both of his wives are connected to Napoleon and Josephine. <laughs> These are the guys that threw him out. All right? Sex and money, that's what it all comes down to, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, next week, uh, Believer and San Martino Higgins.